it is a fear to be aware of that, to just name that like, Hey, I'm afraid these eight things are going to happen. If we do something different in the fall, if we change what we have been doing, if we treat students differently. Um, and, and I would say one of the nice things of the pandemic is for so many of those things, we didn't have a choice, right? We, we didn't have to convince faculty like, hey, you really have to learn how to teach online. And they're like, I don't want to. And we didn't have to do that. Everything's broken, now you have to. So um, this idea of naming what you're afraid of and, and assessing whether that's why you're not changing things, or if it is like, hey, I haven't assessed what I'm doing in a really long time and I need to come back and just say what is working and what is not. Hello, everybody. I'm Rachel Phillips Buck, and this is Cap and Gown. Thank you for joining us. I have Mr. Anthony Melchiori with me today. Hello, sir. I tell you, you just got back uh, from a little trip, and you don't sound that excited. I well, this is me relaxed. I'm oh, okay. on vacation, and I'm very relaxed now. So. I might talk a little bit slower. I might be a little less dynamic, but just count that as, wow, she must have had a great vacation. <laughs> oh, okay. And, and just rub it in. All right. Yeah. <laughs> well, where are you? I am in California uh, here for a couple of clients and a couple of meetings and a convention called Alice, which is uh, a um, investment conference for the hotel industry. And I'm doing all my podcasts from here uh, Monday, wow. Tuesday, and Wednesday. I'm so happy to hear that conferences are coming back. Yeah, it was, uh, there's a, there's a California mandate um, now for masks in LA County. And we actually had the LA uh, tourism president on uh, to explain why they instituted it. It actually made a lot of sense. Yeah. So about, I'd say uh, about 5% or 10% of the conference actually that was coming, didn't come once they found out there was a mask mandate, but it was kind of like, all right, everybody wear their mask, everybody wear their mask. And then we went to a cocktail party outside on a terrace and there was 3000 people, you know, stand on top of each other. Yeah. So, and I was fine because I'm vaccinated, but it was, um, yeah, it's great. It's great to have the conferences back. I'm going to another one next week. I was just, I'm doing a keynote for them and I was just um, actually practicing with them a little while ago. And it's a big one. It's a really, it's the AHOA conference. Yeah. And that's going to be in that, that's going to be in Dallas. Oh, well then we might have to come and see you. I think maybe you will. That would be really fun. We would love that. When is that? That is, I'll be there next, I don't know, the third. Okay. Yeah. We'll have to yeah. talk about that. That's fine. How far are you from Dallas? <clears throat> uh, we're about two and a half hours. Oh, so, right. which, yeah, in, te in Texas, that's like. I, I took a day trip the other day and it was three hours there and back. So oh, okay. that's nothing. So, yeah. That's nothing. Um, well, we get to talk today about fall forward, which one of my friends, Mason, who Mason, <clears throat> I know you drove through Abilene. I hope you enjoyed the Dairy Queen as you drove through. He sent me a message and was like, I'm just down the street from you. But he's a little unhappy about the fact that we're falling forward instead of falling back. Like we're going to lose more time. But that's not what this means. This means we're looking towards the fall and all the great things we're going to do. So rest assured, you can still have your sleep. <laughs> Anthony, you have put, I need to talk about these two pictures that you have posted. So oh I always forget that you, 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 you stalk me. <laughs> I do stalk you. It's part of my job to know what's I love going it. on. What is an upside down Sicilian pie? All right. If I have to tell you, then like, it's, it's not worth it. Basically <laughs> it's the, it, it's the, um, uh, cheese on the bottom sauce on top with Parmesan cheese oh, on top. So it's and crust, it's, right. cheese sauce. Right. It's okay. based, if you go to, there's a very famous, uh, restaurant in Brooklyn called LMB Spumoni Gardens. If you go to LMB Spumoni Gardens, they have, uh, which a lot of people say is the original. This restaurant, you can only get it for takeout, but I was there on a Saturday afternoon by myself. It's kind of my starting to go to place on Saturday afternoon if, if nobody's home. And uh, they came out with this um, Sicilian pizza that was the best thing I've ever had. But before that was that macaroni. Put that macaroni back. Yeah, the, the, that looked I, real good too. Can you put that back? I said to the chef, I said, <clears throat> oh, to the waiter, I said, hey, I just want some, or the owner who's being the waiter, I said, I just want some pasta with, uh, just a light tomato sauce. And um, 
so I said, like, you know, give me some um, linguine or something. So he comes back. There's the chef wants to see you in the kitchen. I was like, uh oh. So I go in the kitchen and the, and the chef's literally got this brand new $12,000 pasta machine and he's cutting new pasta. And he says, ah, I'm a cutting of this pasta. This is the pasta you will have with the salsa today. So all right, he goes, I'm going to make you a salsa that's not on the menu. It's a very light tomato sauce. I am telling you, I put my phone down. I didn't, I didn't have any of my soda. I literally gave this pasta dish the proper <laughs> respect. You went on as a date with it, this pasta dish. <laughs> as I'm eating it, I literally, I'm not kidding. I had a tear rolling down my eye because it was the greatest plate of food I've ever had. Wow. That is high praise. And I have eaten more pasta than most humans. And I was going to say when I posted it, this is the best pasta dish I've ever had out. You Might can. have been the best pasta dish I've ever had, period. Wow. It yeah. was it was insane. So if you're ever in Rockaway, Rocco's, you got, when you come to New York, I got to bring you there. All right. Sounds good. That You made my mouth water just telling me about it. So we do need to do that. Um, so as you alluded to, I have been in Cancun. Um, this is what I was doing for the last five days is staring at this view. Very nice. You would have been very happy with this place. It's called the Excellence Resort. It was wonderful. Well, when you have a name like Excellence mm -hmm. Resort, you better you be excellent. To. I will tell you that the, the staff was so wonderful. Uh -huh. Every time I said thank you for something, they said, oh, it's our pleasure. What else can we do to be helpful? They were wonderful. So they were happy. They were happy you were there. They were so happy. So we got, we passed their stand up, which is a little bit of a sit down, it looks like, but it, they were having their stand up one morning. So that was really fun. They did such a great job. And they have a crazy spa where they use, do all these water treatments on you. So it's like you get in a cold shower and then you get in a sauna and then they've got all these water jets and then you get in a cold, but it was, it was a little insanity, but it was really fun. So I did come back. Did you, did you enjoy it or was it a little bit too much? Honestly. Um, the first time it was a lot. But then I hurt my back, so I had to go back. And then when I knew what to expect, it was better. Oh, okay. You know, the first time they're just like, move here, we do the, and so that was a little bit much, but the second time it was good. So anyway, if anyone ever goes to Cancun, that's the place to go. All right, let's play 20 questions, shall we? Let's go. All right, well, we're in our would you rather, so here we go. Would you rather wear stilettos to sleep or have to wear slippers everywhere you go? Would I rather wear what to sleep? Stilettos to sleep or wear slippers everywhere you go? Stilettos to sleep. That's a weird question. <laughs> I'm telling you, I've asked you 300 questions. So we're, you know, <laughs> they're getting stranger as we go. Would you rather be always stuck in traffic, but find a perfect parking place or never hit traffic, but take forever to park? The first one. Would you rather have super sensitive taste buds or super sensitive hearing? Hearing, since would, I'm deaf. Would you rather eat only pizza for a year or not eat any pizza for five years? Don't eat pizza for five years. Okay. Would you rather never get another present in your life, but always pick the perfect present for anyone else or keep getting presents, but give terrible ones to everyone else? The first one. Oh, yeah. Like, I'm going to be good for everyone else. Okay. Yeah, no, I don't get that many presents and I give a good present, so I'm good. <laughs> <laughs> Would you rather run 100 miles an hour or fly 20 miles an hour? Run. Okay. Would you rather have to wear sweatpants every day for the rest of your life or never wear sweatpants again? Sweatpants every day the rest of my life. Okay. Would you rather detect every lie you hear or get away with every lie you tell? Oh, <laughs> I don't like either one of those. I don't um, either. I don't really like. Don't lie. Um, the second one. The second one. Okay. Um, would you rather give up cursing forever or ice cream for twelve years? Ice cream for twelve years. <laughs> okay. I can't give a cursing for ten minutes. <laughs> <laughs> would you rather be locked for a week in a room that's overly bright or a room that's totally dark? Right. Would you rather sleep in a doghouse or let stray dogs sleep in your bed? Sleep in a doghouse. 
Would you rather never get cold again or never be stuck in traffic again? Never get stuck in traffic again. I love cold. I mean, yeah, that's a good answer. Okay. My favorite, my favorite country is Finland, uh, Finland, Norway, and Sweden. So yeah. Okay. Would you rather visit the interna International Space Station for a week or spend a week in a hotel at the bottom of the ocean? Ocean. Would you rather have all the traffic lights you approach be green or never have to stand in line again? Green lights. Okay, last one. Would you rather lose your long-term memory or your short-term memory? Um, probably my long-term memory because my short-term memory probably helps me be successful at what I'm working on. Yeah, that was. So let me ask you a question, Miss Question Lady. All right. Where do you and when do you come up with these questions? Is it over a period of a day? Is are you sitting? Is it at night? Or is it by the pool? Yeah, no, it's usually on Mondays. I sit down and I'm like, I gotta find the questions for Anthony. So and you go in and Google say, hey, good questions to ask people. Sometimes I do, and then I test them out on Matt. And we tried actually today. I told you last time that I was going to guess and I was going to write down what I thought your answer was going to be. And right. I did like two of them and then it made me too anxious. So I decided not to do it. I didn't want to. <laughs> I was like, this is a terrible idea. What was I thinking? <laughs> All right. So let's do our state of the union today. We're going to be talking about fall forward. I know you guys saw just what's going to happen in the fall. And I want to be thinking about how we're adjusting to some of the changes that are coming on. But as I always do, I want to do State of the Union. There's a lot of things going on for our campuses. Um, there's a great piece in Inside Higher Ed about how our campuses are more than just physical space um, that really talks about how over the pandemic, what we realized is that when we talk about a campus experience, we're talking about this intangible good, which is like, all of the physical spaces, but also those interactions that we're having and services. Um, and the idea that on campus, we have unexpected exchanges with people and conversations. And that when we're talking about what's happening on campus, we're not just talking about the grounds, we're talking about all of those community things that are, um, that are included. So I would encourage you guys to read that one. It's in Inside Higher Ed by Elizabeth Leftfield. Campuses are more than a physical space. I think it's a really thoughtful piece. Um, also, as you guys know, our transfer system in the United States is very broken. So this is um, a, a renewed emphasis on transfer students and schools are saying there's this process, there's no clear process and policies that allow students to move from one college to another. Um, here's a statistic, one in seven community college students who set out to earn a four year degree, earn one within six years. And secondly, the typical college student who tries to change colleges loses 43% of their credits, which wow. is horrible, right? Um, and there's some foundation where schools are saying it's really not in our best interest as a school to make it easy for students to transfer. There's a little bit of a like, um, we are the ones who teach English best. So if you got it somewhere else and you want to transfer it in, we feel like it's probably inferior and you didn't learn what you needed to. But I think this is going to change. I think one of the things that's going to come out of the pandemic is we're going to get some agreements going between schools because students have to be able to transfer and, and not lose, you know, what they've already invested in. Yeah, so and, it's, and, and to me, that's a very interesting point because I had a daughter transfer. It was very stressful, very stressful. Yeah. So having the other things, impediments in her way, she actually graduated six months early, her four year degree. So most of her credits transferred because it was one drama school, the other school to another. But it was very, very stressful. Just the process of I don't like this school. I want to be closer to home. I want to be closer to everything yeah. else. And so I can't imagine then you lose 40 percent of your credits and then you have to you know, deal with that financial burden. And um, yeah. it just it, listen, it's like in, in good <clears throat> business. The easier it is to accept a client, whatever the ramifications are, even if it costs you a little money, the more emotionally attached they are to your school or to your yeah, business. That's right. If you have a clear and easy process, they're going to be really committed to you. So um, there's a new Ohio is being held up as a, a great example of this. They just worked with 
14 private colleges and 10 community co colleges to create transfer pathways for three different degrees. So they all, that's 24 colleges that just have an agreement. If you are in this pathway, we will take all of your, your credit. So I think transfer students are gonna be a huge focus um, over the coming years. Um, and it's gonna be really interesting to see how that gets worked out. Okay, campus tours are back. I would love for you guys to chat for me what's happening on your campus with campus tours. What I'm hearing is that although they are back, they are much smaller. Um, you have to kind of pre-register for that. They are in person, but some schools are saying they really like that because it's a much more personalized, personalized experience where you're speaking to maybe three families who are all interested in engineering as opposed to these huge groups where you can't hear what they're saying. Um, and it's, it's more kind of a general. Yeah. So. And, that, and that's another system from a parent standpoint that needs to be fixed. I, I have all the campus tours I've taken and I was fortunate enough to take plenty of them. Um, I would say there was one or two that stood out to me and it was simply because of the person doing the tour and the person doing the tour was fantastic. And it literally, you tap out. If that tour guide is bad, you just tap out. Yeah. And, and, and your entire enrollment, everything you work for, all the meetings you have, all the money you put in, all the time you put in, all the competition you're trying to beat, you give to a student. One on a person. Monday yeah. morning that may have had exams, may have been, you know, a little intoxicated the night before, whatever. And you're giving them your entire program to say, here you go. Now, that's fine. But just make sure you're that it's person good. is beyond good. Yeah. I think the saying a lot of times is the million dollar walk. Right. Because you're just like, OK, we're just going to walk. Well, this is like a million dollar investment right now. And that's you're trying to show off the best stuff. And that's right. You better make sure that you have your people trained. So they're doing a good job. Well, when, when the host the Western Hotel came out with the heavenly bed, we all stopped in the industry and said, oh, it's the bed, stupid. It's like we're spending all this money yeah. on restaurants <laughs> and hotels and glass and chandeliers. And everybody forgot the bed. Right. And then we focused on the bed. And there's like, oh, that's right. It's about. Oh, the yeah. Sleep. Yeah. <laughs> That that's the thing. Focus. Um, Mason saying the orientations at his school are much smaller, but that late campus tours are sold out. So that's interesting to see. Like there's I, I cannot tell you how many college students, if you say to them, how did you decide to come to this school? They say I came and visited. And as I was walking around, I just knew I just knew this was the place. My daughter, Manhattanville. Boom. Done. Yeah. So I don't know how you replace that experience. Um, I know over the last year, people have been doing Zoom orientations and or, uh, tours and stuff. It's just not the same. It's just not the same as being able to be there. So I'm really eager to see how that continues to evolve. You know what? It's not, there's some arguments to be made about Zoom in business and things. This to me is not even an argument. It's not even a discussion. It's not yeah. even, it's that like, don't, no. The answer yeah. is no. You need people to come and walk your campus for sure. And again, okay. coming from a lot of experience, it's, it's the, the feeling is everything. Yep, absolutely. And my favorite piece of news today, did you see this, Anthony? Um, the University of North Carolina has become the first college athletics program to organize group licensing deals for its current athletes. So we've been talking about this. It's been happening now. Athletes at UNC, including their powerhouse basketball team, are going to be able to earn money for their name, image, and likeness as long as uh, in groups of three or more alongside the UNC trademarks and logos. So UNC is basically just like, hey, come on board. We're going to negotiate that for you. We're going to create kind of the process. They can earn money when a UNC jersey bearing their name and number is sold or for pos posing in uniforms for sponsorship deals. And that money is coming from third party uh third parties, not UNC. So they just have said like, hey, we're on board. We're going to help you. Um, That's navigate. amazing as long as it's above board. And I can see agents going to the college kids and going, hey, why are you letting them? You don't want that deal. Yeah. Right. So it's going to be, I, I get very excited when things, when we're in the newness of a thing, trying to figure out like everything that's going to happen. And what are the moves and what are the unforeseen consequences and how it's yeah. going to play out? It's, so, you know, I, it's a good problem to have because they're finally getting paid. Like you, I just saw a documentary on a plane about the Olympic athletes and they are treated poorly, horribly. They get, I think their, their stipend is 750 or a thousand a month. Oh I mean, it's just, it's just horrific. 
Yeah, that is. I mean, they should be paid. All those athletes should be paid. If they're Are representing you, our country, they should be paid. Have you been watching the Olympics? Uh, a little bit. I've been, you know, I've been traveling, but a little bit. Uh, um, uh, uh, Simone is, uh, the gymnast is out this morning. Did you, any update on that? Did she hurt herself or what, what's the update? I have not heard an update. So I think the um, idea that's being floated is that it's actually she's overwhelmed and she it's not she doesn't want to do it anymore it's not a physical thing that she's just like this is not what i signed up for someone said that to me and i can't agree with that less i'm very curious she is the greatest gymnast ever to compete in gymnastics in any country she's been under pressure her whole life i can't imagine on the world's biggest stage she cracked. There's somebody else told me that, and I don't believe it. Okay, well, we have to look into it because um, if it is true, here's what I have to say about it. If it is true that she looked around at empty stands and she's doing what she's trained to do, and she's like, I don't want to do this anymore, then that is indicative of, I think, some pandemic issues that we are going to continue to see in other lines of work. I think people are saying, I don't know why I'm doing this. I'm not going to do this thing anymore. So it will be very interesting to see what that. That's a good point. I, I I just, I can't imagine that that person with that mindset, you have to think most of the time, 99.99% of the time she's competing alone anyway, yeah. because she's practicing. Yeah. So um, I understand what you're saying. And I, 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 it makes sense. I'd be surprised, but it might, if, if that's the case, kind of like Michael Phelps, is on this, you know, mission to let everybody know about mental health, it will open the conversation for mental for health. For sure, for sure. And in fact, maybe that would be the only um, reason why she might come out is to say like, hey, I'm going to do this catastrophic thing. And the reason is because then we can start having a conversation about how it's a wreck for everybody else. Yeah, so but the only problem is, is she took a spot on a team and I can't imagine there's somebody she knows is in America wanting that spot and she had it and she threw it away. I can't imagine. that. Yeah. I was shocked this morning. I was really shocked about it. Okay. So we've done the state of the union. I, Anthony, we get to talk about route 66 today. Oh, I love. Route so, 66. Yeah. So we're going to talk about hotel impossible route 66, but I'm also going to cast route 66 as an institution um, where things changed and you have to adapt to that change in order to be successful. So I'm going to talk a little bit about that and and do some introduction there. And then my goal really for our time at the end of today is to give you some action items because I know for our listeners, I mean, I cannot believe August is almost here in higher education. You have like May where the students are leaving. You have June where you're doing all your work. July oftentimes is kind of a quiet time for us, but as soon as August comes, we are full on sprinting towards the fall. And so I know for so many of you guys, you're already thinking about your fall initiatives, you're doing plannings, you're thinking about um, student athletes coming. There's just, we're in that home home run stretch for the fall. And so I wanna give some action items as you're um, thinking about those initiatives uh, for, for the fall. So let me talk about Route 66. I have some trivia about Route 66 that I want to make sure, I mean, because it's amazing. So commissioned in 1926, um, it's called the Mother Road by John Steinbeck in his uh, novel Grapes of Wrath, also known as America's Main Street. It um, was replaced when it was only 30 years old, which is really sad. Uh, Oh, no, no, wait, that's not true. Wait, I don't know what this says. So, there was a highway built in, I believe, uh, the 70s. That started changing it, but I could that, be wrong. That overtook it. Yes. So it was not yet 60. It was it was under 60 years old when, right. it, when it got replaced by the interstate. So it passes through California, Arizona, New Mexico, Texas, Oklahoma, Kansas, Missouri, and Illinois. Um, do you know the shortest segment of Route 66? The, what state it's in? I don't know why you would know that. No, I would because I was on there. No, I had a lot of information when I was on the show. So I might know that. Uh, give me the states again. And I'll tell you. Okay. California, Arizona, New Mexico, Texas, Oklahoma, Kansas, Missouri, and Illinois. 
California. It is Kansas. And Kansas is barely 13 miles long. Oh, wow. Isn't that interesting? Yeah, it is interesting. And New Mexico is the longest at 392 miles. So the whole thing is about 2,400 miles. So really interesting. Crosses three time zones. Um, and you know it was one of the impetus to get the motel industry going? No. Yeah, because think about it. It's 2,000 miles long. So you're going to take a drive. So that's where the motel was really kind of built. It was built on Route 66. All these mom and pop places and all these bed and breakfast and all this like um, uh, Airbnb now, that all started uh, when Route 66 uh, popped up. Because if you're going and you got your map in front of you, and you're going from Illinois to California, where are you going to sleep? Yeah. It's too long for you to just do the long haul. So you better right. have and to It's not like you had GPS and say, you know, I'll stay at the Holiday Inn Express. So you had to map it out. And so that's where the motel um, became um, American Hotel Register, which was a sponsor of my show, actually invented the word motel. Oh, mo yeah. it's a motor hotel. Is yeah. that what it, where it comes from? Yeah, their grandfather invented it. And also one other tidbit of useless information yes, is do you know that um, during the Depression, the war, they had to uh, make sure that they had enough paper for hotels to register guests because it's a federal law that every guest has to be registered into a hotel. It's a federal law. So, you know, those big registration books that you see yeah. in the movies, those registration books was a federal document. So when you checked into a hotel, you had to sign into that uh, registration or um, you can get, you know, the hotel can get in trouble. So the government ensured during the war and all, all, all the things that this country's gone through uh, that all hotels had paper. And I know that because I went to the uh, American Hotel, hot uh, the um, American Hotel Registers Companies Museum, which is in their headquarters. That's awesome. I did yeah. not realize that was a federal. So they do that because they want to be able to follow up, like track down people. To I find guess. Out how yeah. interesting that is really fascinating so um the first mcdonald's was on route 66 in california so oh, I know. that's pretty interesting and then the last sign what original route 66 sign was taken down in 1977 mm. so what happened to route 66 was it was replaced by all of these highways that's um 40 I have the list of them. It's like 55, 44, 40, 15, and I-10 replaced it. So they started bypassing, right, these little motels. And now we have this interstate system. What I think is really helpful about the comparison between Route 66 and higher education and what's going on for us now is that it was an institution. It's like things came to be because of this road. Exactly as you said, like hotels are like, this is where we're going to be. Restaurants say, this is where we're going to live. And then something changed and um, the hotels along that route had to fundamentally change the way they were doing business or they were not going to live anymore. And I really think that we're at that place in higher education where it's like, we've been doing things this way. Things are changing now. And we were doing good work, but we have to come to grips with the fact that things are going to be different and we have to do things in a way that we have not done them before, right? Um, so my encouragement for the fall is that we're continuing to think about new ways to accomplish what we've already done. So you have an episode, Anthony, where you went along Route 66, and I'm not going to do this episode justice. I would encourage you guys to all go watch it because I'm not going to talk about the town where they have the donkeys that are free which that's amazing that was a that blew my brains out that blew, that blew my brains out that was a mining town where when they shut down the mining town they just like were like okay donkeys you live here now so like they roam the main streets and like people get that was amazing yeah it really it was really um it was it was great to be an american at that moment i was like this is this is americana and i i just said this yesterday to some people i was like america is like every country within one country like w like that felt like a different country yeah that town yeah that was awesome so that that one i i don't have pictures of and then also you went to this little mom and pop place and made your own snow cone yes which that was awesome too it's just it's a different kind of experience 
than big hotels and fancy restaurants. And um, it's, it is. It's Americana. Downfall. Yeah. It's Americana. Yeah. So I would encourage everybody to watch that episode. It was a really great when I think it's uh, season six, episode one. But I wanted to talk about it because you address three different hotels. And I feel like these hotels are different than ones than you usually do because they are all um, really hard workers. They're really committed to their work. They're delightful people. The hardship that all of these motels is having is that they are not sure how to make the transition from what Route 66 used to be to this new thing, which is like, we need to convince you to take the slow road. We need to convince you to stay at these different places and to really experience this. And so as you, know, you yeah, go if, ahead. I, if I can interrupt you, I think that's a good point because it, in you saying that it reminds me of a, per, a kid going from their parents' home and they're supposed to act a certain way. And now they're going to college and they don't know how to act. And yeah. the, the hotel is the same thing. It's like, oh, we're Route 66. We're less than. We're not anything special and the, the the reverse of that is true you know you're not your parents like right. you have to find yourself and so these three hotels we had to find who they are and stay attached to it. it's like you can go home on the weekends but you have to stand by yourself yeah for sure and I love the idea that we are saying and I think higher education is like this we do good work we're committed we just have to be adaptable. And I think that is very, very hard for people who have established a rhythm and a pattern of being. And what you said to all of these hotels was like, hey, stop what you're doing. You have to adapt in some ways. And, and so I want to go through them. Um, the first one is the Luxury Inn, which can we talk about the name for a second? Because, huh? -uh. <laughs> this family was precious, though. I loved them. Yeah, um, yeah. they, so owned by Roger, he is both the manager owner, like works the front desk, works his tail off, lives in the hotel. Um, and in fact, this is you telling him like, do not live at the hotel because you will never stop working, but he worked so hard and, um, he had things like no website. He had no way for student or for people to check in. So he was using this is his process, the, these cards with this little, like, I don't even understand what he's doing here on the right. I guess putting on the slots of the room. Is that what those cards, where those cards yeah. are going? Okay. That's correct. So keeping track, but his family was really amazing and they were really hard workers. And this is a conversation you have with them where you're like, Hey, can we talk? And he's like, I can't talk to you. This is his fiance and his sister. I can't talk to you because I have to get these rooms turned and we don't have enough sheets. And so I have to do this laundry. And you're like, okay, hold on. Help me understand what's going on. And his, he was working for his mom. They were all working for his mom, right? They said, right. you need to go retire. We are going to come and move in and take care of the hotel. And their work ethic and their commitment was amazing. Yeah. And the way they liked each other, I always liked family members that like, each other. listen, family members are going to argue and fight, but they liked each other. Like yeah. they were very protective of each other. And, the, and the, uh, his, his girlfriend, I think said to his, or his fiance said to that, to me that you don't know how hard these two work. They're like the hardest working people I know. And so I love those people. And you know, when, when people have good attitudes, um, everything they're doing that's broken, can be fixed. I mean, you have a good attitude. Who cares? I'm not, I'm not that smart. It's like, I make mistakes all the time. So if you have something to, to help me get it fixed, I'll fix it. But the attitude is everything. And yeah. all three of these people in all three of these hotels had great attitudes. So what it does, Anthony, is it makes it so that you're not spending your time trying to fix interpersonal issues or trying to say work harder or, hey, you need to be cleaner or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. You're just like, I'm going to plus it. Everything you're doing, I'm just going to plus it. Yeah, or I'm just going to, like you've seen some shows, I walk away. Like I, I had a business dealing yesterday. I was here uh, and for, for the deal with this business uh, problem. And I just like, no problem. We're done. No harm, no foul. I'm not upset. <laughs> it's like, because there's no way, like my team's like, what, did you ask this question? Did you ask that question? Yes. No, because I don't care. It's, I can't fix that. 
Right. Like if they're willing to come and talk and communicate, then fine. We're, we're communicate, but they're not interested in communicating. So I'm not going to sit there and ask because I don't care. Goodbye. Right. And, 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 I and don't that's, care to do business with you. Yeah. Yeah. yeah if, you know what? It's because you don't deserve my energy. Mm-hmm. You have to prove to me you deserve it. And that, same thing with a student, right? You know, a, a student that really cares you know, like they deserve your energy. A student that says they're going to do something and continuously doesn't, like yeah. you just run out of energy. You just have to respect like that's their decision. Um, but I think what you said is right in terms of in higher education, people do not generally pick this work because they want to be lazy, because they're not committed to it, because they don't value it. In general, we are a group of people who say this is really important work and we love it and we want to help students. And so what you said is like, when you have that attitude, we can fix everything else. We just have to be flexible and we have to listen to each other, but we're not fundamentally trying to talk to people who are like, I don't want to do the job and I think it's stupid. So um, it does really resonate, I think, with people in higher education for you to be talking about a great group of people who just need a little bit of guidance or they just need a little bit of help to, to kind of get better. Um, and you, you did that. So one thing that you did on the left is their room before, which all of the conversation was, Hey, you're on route 66. And this looks like anywhere USA. Like I cannot tell where it is. And then the designer came in and gave them this, like feels more like what it should. And I want to challenge our schools about this because I love the idea that each of our schools are a place and they do have truths about those places. So you're in West Texas or you're in Georgia or you're in New York City and there are truths about where you are. And one of the things that we can do to be really amazing is to embrace those things and help our students understand a sense of place within our campus and our community. Um, And I I feel like you guys are always doing that with hotels to say, man, if I'm on route 66, I don't want to feel like I'm in the Bahamas. That does not make any sense. Right. So let's embrace place and really make a difference. If I go to a sushi restaurant, I don't want chicken Parmesan. Yeah, that would be awful. (laughs) I would, if I owned a sushi restaurant, I would put it on the menu just to have everybody be like, really? (laughs) Terrible idea. Um, The other thing that you did that I want to encourage our schools about is I talk about this in terms of A, a technology update and B, a data refresh. So um, Roger literally said, like, I do not have money for a computer. There's no way that I can use this, you know, that I'm going to be able to, to come up with technology. And what you said at the end of the day is, if you cannot afford to not, you, you have to be able to be booked online because the way Route 66 used to work, exactly as you said, Anthony, is you have a map and you drive through and you're like, here's the next town. Oh, look, here's a vacancy. We're going to stop and we're going to stay here. We don't have reviews. We're not booking ahead. We're not doing any of that. That is not reality anymore. And so you said the way you adapt from the old institution to this new reality is you have to have the technology to support these processes. Because um, I think you told him he was 50 out of like 60 hotels. Right. And no one is going to stay at your hotel if that's what's happening. On you're not going to get to that, that page. You're on page number seven. No one's yeah. going to Yeah. Yeah. So that's right. So I would say um, the other thing that I, the uh, analogy I want to make is that so often when I'm talking about our software that supports student success, we do audits for our current clients and I'll say something like, Hey, you should be using this thing. And they're like, I didn't even know that was there. Well, the checkup for technology where you say, I need to meet with you and I want you to tell me what's new and I want to understand and are we doing this in the best way and what else can we do? We're proactive about that, but everybody should be doing that with all of their technology because you may have things you don't even know you have and you don't have to go spend money somewhere else when you can use it to do you know these things that, that it was built to do. I get very frustrated when I'm in a meeting with somebody and they're telling me a very convoluted process that they're doing. And I'm like, please stop, please don't do that. That makes me crazy. 
I want it to be efficient. I want you to use the technology to really leverage you um, and not say it's too expensive because the truth is we're getting to the place where it's too expensive not to have technology to help you with your students, you know? So I'm always so happy when you just give somebody a website and it's like you blow their minds. You know, they're like, this is amazing. And you're like, you should have a website, friend. <laughs> yeah. Simple thing. Listen, I've given a couple of chefs old menus from the restaurant from like 50 years before, and they cry. It's the simple things. Yeah, that's awesome. Um, the other thing that you did for this hotel was you rebranded. So like I said, Luxury Inn, which it was not. But you guys rebranded it and called it the Mountain View Inn, which it was. It had a gorgeous view of a mountain. And I wonder, Anthony, why do you think that it didn't occur to them to rebrand it, it? Like they just, it seemed too hard for them or it, they didn't think of it. Or why do you think that was? Have you ever jumped out of an airplane? I have not. Will you? Yeah, I would. I, I got to wait until okay. my daughter's 18 because I don't want right. to, you know. Well, well I but. won't. I just never will. <laughs> I just never will because I'm afraid. I just won't do it. I'll never jump out of an airplane unless unless there's extreme circumstances. Okay. Same thing. People are afraid. That's it. It's just they're they're frightened. What what am I frightened about? Billion people jumped out of airplanes and a very small percentage hit the ground without their parachute. But I'm afraid. Billions of people have changed their business model and some people haven't. It's just because it's fear. If I do this, what happens? Like right now, I'm making it. I'm just making it. Right. Like, you know, we're paying our rent. We're, we're, I bought a car. I'm saving a little money. I'm just making it. If I change this and it doesn't make it, I lose the hotel. I lose my rent. I lose my car. I lose my house. And I lose my future. So it's fear. It's complete utter fear. So I would be very curious, and our listeners can chat this, but also I think just like as a mental exercise. Um, I'm really curious how often it is I'm afraid. Like I would rather deal with the bad I know than move into the unknown because it could be worse, right? right? And then how many times people are so on automatic pilot that they do not stop and say like, wait, what's working and what's not working for me here? Because you're really good at that, Anthony, of like constantly being like, that's not, okay, we're gonna throw that out. That's not good. Now we're gonna do this. Now we're gonna do this. And I do think it's a combination of people saying, I'm afraid to try something else. And also people saying, I literally have never assessed whether or not that's still working. Yeah, right. so I'm really yeah. curious and, about that. And, and, and I think it's also for personally, it comes from a, a need to not waste time. I hate wasting time. I hate it. I hate it. I just like, it's like, why am I going to do this? I know I'm not going to get the same results. So let's fix it. And, um, and that, so that's what it comes down to. It comes down to fear and it comes down to, um, people are okay being comfortable as opposed to being uncomfortable for a short period of time to get comfortable in a real way long-term. Yeah. So I think the application for our listeners there is to twofold, both, if it is a fear to be aware of that, to just name that like, Hey, I'm afraid these eight things are going to happen. If we do something different in the fall, if we change what we have been doing, if we treat students differently. Um, and, and I would say one of the nice things of the pandemic is for so many of those things, we didn't have a choice, right? We, we didn't have to convince faculty like, hey, you really have to learn how to teach online. And they're like, I don't want to. And we didn't have to do that. Everything's broken. Now you have to. So um, this idea of naming what you're afraid of and, and assessing whether that's why you're not changing things or if it is like, hey, I haven't assessed what I'm doing in a really long time and I need to come back and just say what is working and what is not working. You, you know, it's interesting because in the beginning, my wife's a pre-K teacher and you know she can retire anytime she wants and there's two more years that she's done, but she can, you know, her, her um, union said basically she can retire now, no problem. Um, but she's gonna stay for another two years, which just because she wants to. And in the beginning, when she had to teach online and technology overwhelmed her, she literally sobbed and cried. And I've never seen her more upset because she didn't, she was so afraid of it. And she was so petrified that she would look like the old lady, like the old person. They did, she doesn't know technology. She actually said that. And then at the end of the year, 
I said to her, I said, do you think your children, your class um, lost anything? And she goes, no. She goes, were you as close to your kids today as you were? She goes, yeah, absolutely. I, so you got, more, she was, the kids lost nothing because she embraced it eventually. She worked harder. Yeah. She worked to make sure she embraced it. And then something that really surprised me, and that surprised me, was really nice to see, is about three weeks ago, I see her making posters for the first day of class. Well, the first day of class in New York isn't until mid-September. Yeah. And she's in June getting ready for the first day of September. So that tells you how motivated she is. And somehow I really think teaching online made her fall back in love with teaching because it was so much harder for her. Yeah. And then, but she got so much out of it. And so, so that's, that was, a, that's a good example of, she was afraid, but to your point, she was like, no choice. You teach it online and the story. Yeah. I love that because I, I really, it makes me happy to think if you can get out of the rut and, and approach a thing you love in a different way, you're reminded this is not just, we just keep doing the same thing every time. Like I could do anything I wanted. So what am I going to do? Right. So that's and really the cool. great. And the great add on to that, that we didn't expect was we as a family got to see mommy teach. That's so awesome. we got to see everything. Like matter of fact, when we, you know, we're hanging out, we start singing the good morning song. So like, <laughs> you know, it's, it's where the barbecue and my wife puts on the good morning song and everybody sings it. So we learned what it takes. Like, it was like, if you follow me traveling, you see what I do for a living. Yeah. Well, you kind of did on, that's why we have, you know, you're, you're doing it now, but, but it was really nice. So, so, that's so awesome. when you, when you, when you just try new things, uh, it's, it's, it's scary, but typically it always works out. I have to tell you that I think one of the best outcomes of the pandemic is the acceptance that we are parents as well as our professional self and the number of people's kids who come into meetings that I'm in because they're walking through the room or they need to ask a question because we're all in the same space makes me so happy. It's so happy to see people as whole people instead of, you know, this idea, like everybody, I'm going to the office and you have no idea what I do and you don't exist anymore. So I love that. How many people have you asked, what does your mom and dad do for a living? And they don't know. I swear to God. Like, I don't know. Yeah. I don't know that my daughter, knows. I I'm going to have to ask her because she's very smart and she's very in tune. I'm not sure that she would be able to. I, don't know. I met your daughter. I don't think she's that smart. <laughs> I think she's the smartest kid I've ever met. Well, she and, most, and, and very, very charming. I'm going to, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to ask, I'm going to video her and I'm going to ask her, what do I do for a living? And we'll see what she thinks. But in fact, we should all do that. I feel like we you should ask Anthony blog. questions. She's going to say, <laughs> you ask Anthony questions. <laughs> you hang out with Anthony all the time. That's what I think. Okay. Your next hotel is the Red Garter, which this is another one where they did an awesome job. Um, I, I need to just show this picture and then we'll move on. It, it was one of the first, uh, Route 66 brothels. Yeah. So brothel, pool hall, opium den, historic building. Here's you in your <laughs> feather boa and your cowboy hat. They yeah, but let me let me let me let me just tell you that was at the bottom of the stairs for guests to put on. So it wasn't like I came I came just that way. <laughs> I wasn't gonna mention that it was. I thought it was just like your get up for Route 66, right? No, that was no 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 no. That was that was at the bottom of the stairs. <laughs> Um, well, they killed it when it came to rooms. They were doing an awesome job. Like you said, like this is exactly the kind of place that you want to stay. But this is another hotel where their technology, so you have a before of their website on the left, which is like just straight words. You can't book. It's nothing. And you looked at their website and then you came and you were like, how is this hotel have this website? This is insanity. And what it made me think as I'm thinking about the fall is just making sure that we are telling the real story of what we are doing on our campus. So if you are doing something amazing, you better make sure that other people know about it. And I think for some of us, we don't, um, we're, we're so focused on the work that we forget we have to be telling people something congruent, like, hey, we have this amazing program and I run it and here's the outcomes and you're going to love it because I'm so focused on the work. Yeah, but it's, it's, it's like, like looking at those two websites, it's like wearing the wrong 
outfit, like like you're going to a tuxedo, you know, to a formal, and you're wearing shorts. It's like, yeah. wait, wait, dude, you're in the hotel business, and you're trying to attract people to have fun, and you're putting a website on. It looks like they're going to the library. Yeah. No one wants to go to the library when they're traveling. Yeah, exactly. So I really like the idea for us of being encouraged to make sure we're congruent. How we're showing up to the party should be representative of kind of what everybody expects from us, right? Um, this is also the hotel where playing on your $10,000 martini at the Algonquin, you did the $66 apple pie. Um, so Anthony, which first of all, I love this baker because you were like, are you the best baker in the world? And she's like, yeah. <laughs> yeah, like immediately. I was like, the best ever? She was, yeah. Yeah. And then you're like, can you make a great apple pie? And she's like, yeah, my grandmother's pie is the best ever. So that was right. fun. Um, and then you were like, this is the reason people are going to stop here. It doesn't matter if anyone ever buys it. Just the fact that they're going to be talking about it. There's people are going to know about it. What was right? it, the, it was the hundred dollar apple pie. But, it right? was the $66 apple pie. Right. Okay. I'm sorry. Yeah. That yeah. makes sense. There was yeah. $66 apple pie. And um, my friend that is part owner of Serendipities in New York that just reopened, yeah. he just, uh, you may have seen it, he just put out a press release about the $200 French fries that just won um, the Guinness Book of World Records for most expensive French fries. Wow. And he's been all, all over every TV show and for $200 French fries. So it's not, and I said to him that, well, I don't want to tell him, well, I can, this is not open to the public. I said to him, do you, I said, do you want to sell? all these fries because no they all want to buy them but it wasn't it wasn't that that wasn't the point the point was to get our name out there and to get this book of world records and but now it's become a thing and you need something listen everybody wants to feel something they haven't felt they want to feel different so if i'm on route 66 and my wife said hey we need to stop and for some reason i saw that there was a 66 dollar apple pie I've got to go have it. If I can afford it, I'm going. It's not the point that I'm spending sixty-six thousand on apple pie. It's like that has got to be insane. Like How that plate that of exist? pasta. Yeah. To the point that plate of pasta that the chef made for me with much love. If that plate of pasta was one hundred dollars, I would buy it. Yeah. Yeah. So the application of that for our schools is to say, we have got to wow our students and. What's important about that is you, all of you on your campus have wow things. You have amazing faculty, you have great programs, you have such love and kindness and dedication to your students. Like you have it. It's not that we have to try to figure out what it is. It's just that you have to do a good job of making sure that people know that story and are talking about it because mm -hmm. otherwise, it's like it doesn't exist. Right? And also yeah. on the other side of that, you know, I just, I don't know where I heard it, but recently this week or last couple of weeks, I, people focus on the wow and it's all about the wow. And then they forget the fundamentals, right? So like if you go to a big school, it's the football team, right? And it's like everybody's about the football team. You, are you forgetting about the students? Are you forgetting about the education? Are you forgetting about the grounds? Are you forgetting about the food? Because you're all focused on the football team and it's the biggest, you know, best football team. So the wow should be 10%. The yeah. wow is there to get people's attention, but the rest of it is really the, the, the groundwork that you have to do. And the wow just gets me to your hotel or your school instead of yeah. somebody else's school. So if that hotel had been a train wreck with bed bugs and roaches and dirt, I, would, I wouldn't think about six dollar apple pie is not going to save them. Right. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I think I, so my challenge for our listeners would be to think about what's under your purview. That is really remarkable. Cause I know you have those things. Mason's a great ex example. He's a, has been a music professor for a long time. And he's awesome at it. Students love him. They love taking his class. He does a great job at that. We have to talk about that. We have to be telling people we have this professor that everybody loves and is going to want to spend time with. And so what is the thing that you're doing that you would say, I mean, if I'm forced to, um, Lisa, what is the thing that you're doing where you're like, if I'm forced to say, I'm going to tell you, I do an awesome job at supporting students in this way. Or we do an amazing job of giving students this program that they need. So I think that that's a really important thing. It's one of the, the and, and being a teacher is one of the most powerful things because you can get rid of the faculty, you can get rid of the parents, you can get rid of all the problems. And when you close that door, 
It's you and the students and your brand is on display. That's why these reviews are so important. It's like your brand yeah. is there. And if you say, well, a student said I'm too tough and you don't like that. Well, if one student said it, who cares? But if 10 students says it, so, so that's your brand. You're right. putting that brand out there. So I think it's a great opportunity to really, you know, teaching really has an ability to, you can be an entrepreneur and be your own brand. And that's yeah. what's, what's fascinating about it. Yeah. So one last thing I want to say about that, I would see that Josh Spears has joined us and he has a great thing that he tells schools about athletes being the front porch to their university because athletes are traveling and so they're going all of these different places and they're meeting different people and also they're competing. And so people are watching your students when they're competing. And it is an introduction to your campus culture and what sure. you're about. So when you think about how you pour into your athletes, they are the introduction to your school in so many different ways. And it's vital that they're congruent with your culture and that, that if, if I see your athletes playing, However they play, whether they have good sportsmanship or they don't, or they're fair or they cheat, however they're doing it, my assumption is that's what that school is about. So it's so important to have a, that understanding of their, their ambassadors for you, right? Okay, last one, Canyon Motel and RV Park, your first RV Park ever. Yep. Which I love those people. I couldn't love those people anymore. I love these people too. They, um, Kevin and Shirley, they work super hard. They have an awesome place. And so, they have hotel experience. They, they met in a hotel. Yeah. So 21 rooms, 47 RV spaces, check, check in place. Um, it really was beautiful. You guys did a great job of the playground. So it was before a little bit run down. You gave them the gift of a new playground, which was awesome. But Anthony, the part I want to talk about here is when you give them this train and this sweet one, <laughs> so you come around the corner with it and she's like, that's awesome. That's so fun. Right. And then you get out and you're like, it's yours. And she's like, what? And you're like, I'm giving this to you. And she's like, she basically is like, I thought this was just good TV. And you're like, no, this is a gift for you. Which first of all, they were flabbergasted. Do you want to say something about that before I tell yeah, you? I, I, I'm actually emotional about it because that's the beautiful story in front of the camera. But my beautiful story happened behind the camera. And I said to my, my producer, I was like, I need to give these people something special. And I, I saw a train or something in, in, my, in, my, in my travels, like, I don't know, it could have been years ago. And I said, I'd like to get them a train. And Maddie, who is my producer, um, young girl young woman and me and her had a really good bond. Like she basically didn't tell me to go sit in the corner and I would, and very few people can do that. She had complete control over me. And I said to her, I said, do you think you can make it happen? And she goes, no, but I'll try. And she got a company somehow on a fly to donate a $40,000 train. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Was that the value? Forty thousand. Yes. I think it was forty-seven. But yeah, yeah. Forty-seven thousand dollar train on the web. So when I saw that train for the first time, I wish that would have made TV because I had a bigger reaction than the <laughs> owner I gave it to. Well, it was awesome, but my favorite part about that exchange was when she said, "Hey, you coming here?" and looking at what we've done for 30 years and saying, you're doing a great job. You're doing it right. I love everything that you've done. This is amazing. The gift that that was to them. She's like, because you're you. So it's not like some random person showing up and being like, Hey, you're doing a good job. But like what, what you did an affirmation from them. I just, I just know for the next rest of their lives, they're going to be like, but Anthony said we were doing a good job. So we just keep, we're just going to keep doing what we're doing. Yeah. So. You know, and, and that, and you know, it's interesting because I was thinking about that as you were talking before, that if you're in a supervisory role, telling someone in a real way, quiet way, yeah. in a very non-celebratory ceremonial way, hey, just so you know, you're a damn good teacher. You're a damn yeah. good administrator. Hey, you run that cafeteria 
and our students love the food that you provide. Like saying it in a real way, just like, again, not with a lot of ceremony. And, yeah. and I remember saying it to them and I remember feeling it from my bones. Right. It's like, yeah, you're like, like you can criticize me. I don't do everything perfect, but the majority of your heart is seen. And that is really important. And that's what I took out of that is the affirmation, um, not only general affirmation, but also I've had this experience where there are people who, in fact, Anthony, I think you did this for me where, so doing this kind of podcast and interviewing people, there's a lot of work that goes into it and having somebody who's like, Hey, I see what you're doing. Like, I see all the stuff that you're doing so that you can show up and be prepared here having somebody who understands deeply the work you're doing and affirm you is so helpful to be like, okay, okay, I, I'm doing a good job. So, you, 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 you know, there's, there's, there's something on TikTok or some, one of the social media platforms that said, I want to thank me. Right. <laughs> and it's like, and it's like, I want to thank me for all the hard work. I want to thank me for getting up in the morning. Yeah. I want to thank me for having the courage. <laughs> I want to thank me. And I think when I saw that, I started laughing, but like, I don't care. Like, Hey, you do a good TV show. You're, you're this, you're that, whatever. Like I, you, we have to thank ourselves. And we have to thank people. Like I, my wife, like she gets up and she worries about the kids and the cooking and the clean everything. It's like, so the things that she does to provide like financially, like she's a teacher. So, you know, she helps is, is, is the thing, but, the little things is it like getting yeah. on a plane at three o'clock in the morning, to get home or, or making sure my, you know, everything that I do, the small things that I do to get prepared to do what I do for a living um, is tough. And that's, you know, it's challenging. So when you really say like, thank you for that stuff, like, yeah, the presentation was great, but I knew what it took you to get to that presentation. That to me is when people say things like that, and like, and, and, and they literally stop saying, I don't give a crap who you are. I don't give a crap about your TV show, but like, you're so fair. Like I've learned how to yeah. like, like, like I've learned how to square up on people and hold my, hold them accountable, but also understand them when I'm really mad at them. Like right. when I'm really angry and understanding where they're coming from. And if we're, so, so to me, if I learned anything in this industry is I've learned when people are letting their emotions get the best of them when they should just be understanding what it takes for that person to even get up in the morning to provide. They may not be providing the best, but just to have some capacity to, to have empathy. I think that's great. And I think we say that with our students all the time when we say, I see you. I know you're not going to class. I know you're not doing a great job here. I know you feel overwhelmed. I see you. Come, come be with me. I'm going to help you, right? That, not the outcome, but I see you and I want to be on your team, I think is so powerful. So yeah, well, I love yeah, that. My, I have, my social media manager says, I appreciate you. And I was like, every time she says that, I was like, wow, that's really special. Yeah, that's great. So you guys, as we talk about fall, I, I could talk for like a hundred hours on all of these things. I'm just going to put them up so that you can see them. You should be thinking about orientation. You should be thinking about collecting new relationships for your students. So you know what those touch point relationships are. Please refresh your data and technology. Please be thinking about what new outcomes and measurements you want to have and what technology helps you. And if you have questions about that, if you're one of our clients, call me. I have like next week, I'm just doing client meetings all week because everybody is like, okay, what's the next thing and how are we going to use this better and that sort of thing. So please, I would love to talk to you about that. Think about your language that you're using to describe different things. I would encourage you to pick a new partner this semester, somebody who would be helpful to you in your work. You would be helpful to them in their work and just start a relationship with them and start talking about how you can have some of that synergy. Please be thinking about your students who are deciding on their major. We have a lot of resources for that. So if you're interested, I'd love to talk to you about that. And then also, I think one thing that's coming out of the pandemic is presidents of institutions have to get involved. I've told you about presidents who are calling students, who are coming to see students, this idea that presidents would be paying attention to what is going on with their students, I think it's going to be a great initiative for the fall. Um, and there's a lot of really nice ways to do that. So in the fall, starting, um, I think next week, we're going to start this new series about student support and the conditions for student support that are coming out of Tinto's work. So things like commitment and expectations, support, feedback, involvement, learning. I'm going to go over those for the next couple of weeks. 
um, as we get ready for our fall work. But I would just remind you guys, this is the time um, to be thinking about what's going to go on in the fall and those new initiatives and how you can overcome fear about doing things differently and also assess the things that you've done really well and then the things that maybe need some change. So, And, and, yeah. and I think, you know, one of the things I've learned over this period of time and, and to kind of get back to everything you just said is people like in, in the wilderness, you know, other animals smell fear, right? Mm -hmm. They smell worry and then they go and they like, they, they, they control that person or that animal. Yeah. I, I've just had this experience where um, I'm here at this conference and there's this young lady who's the uh, senior vice president of uh, this organization. And basically she has 60% of all hotel owners are part of this organization. Wow. And the second the, the, the pandemic happened to this second, she didn't look scared. She didn't look worried. She, I, I almost, I, I said that last night over a drink. I was like, you're not human. Like the, <laughs> you never showed, like you were sweating or you were nervous or you were overwhelmed. And she was taking calls at four o'clock in the morning, seven days a week. And they, these people were losing their businesses and their homes. And like, she had real problems and she never showed right. fear. Yeah. And out of all the people I've ever met, I'm going to remember that. She didn't talk about it. She was about it. Yeah. And so if your students see your excitement, your passion, or you're a business person, when they see passion, I had somebody early in my career said to me, you know, I want to go where you're going. I go, well, I don't know where I'm going. They're like, I don't know where I'm going in two years. But they're like, can you go? Can I go with you? And I was like, but I don't know where I'm going. They go, I don't know where you're going either, but wherever you're going, it seems fun. It's like, like you always, you. Seem, yeah. you always seem excited. Yeah. And to me, going into the new school year, if you're passionate about what you do, man, your excitement will just pay so many different, even if you don't have all the answers, even if you don't go down and check and say, be this and be that and be this, just be excited to be there. Yeah. And we get students back, which I'm so excited. Right. About. We're you're just excited to so happy to have students back on campus and yeah. have a, a, a different kind of um, normal. And you know what's great? We have the opportunity to complain about students being back too when they're back. Finally. <laughs> <laughs> Last night we were, at the, we were at this convention. Everybody's like, oh my God, the convention, the convention. Within like, by the end of the night, they're, they're like, oh, I did so much talking. You know, <laughs> it's like, they're already complaining about conventions. Like, yes, That's we're wrong. back. <laughs> You're like, we've been longing for this piece. Well, Anthony, I counted. This is our 20th this was our 20th episode of Cap and Gown. Wow, you firing me? Is that so, it? No, I, we've just done a lot of really good work and thinking about, I mean, all of the stuff that we've covered and the change from the first time that we did Cap and Gown, like all of the things that have been evolving. So I'm looking forward to many, many more Cap and Gowns with you. Um, thank you for joining me. I always appreciate it. Thank you. It's always an honor. Yeah, thank you. Listeners, thank you guys so much. And we will see you next week for another episode of Cap and Gown. Have a great day. Bye.